Well, I, uh, I'm supposed to be running this question and answer session, this discussion, but I have to say I had almost, I, 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 I get almost no credit for everything that's happened. I think that Paulina and Megan and I've done a great job of putting together a session that's kept the room full at late on Thursday afternoon. Um, uh, while we're getting uh, the chairs all set up, I will make notes as I run along. One of the things that occurred to me is, um, first of all, I think that, that the, it's very interesting to see the potential interaction between uh, people working in top brain works, motor neuroscience, and people working in uh, machine robots, how to make, how to make, make robots work well with people. But what occurred to me is that uh, there are a couple of so one of the things that occurred to me is that it, it seems like there are a couple of uh, continuing challenges. And for example, one of the things that, that I saw was that quite a number of the, of the approaches are using optimization methods, either inverse optimal control or optimal control. And that's interesting, and the, the, the technology available to do that's getting better because we get cloud computing and better storage and better faster computers. But we still have Donna to worry about, right? Is that person of nationality? So, is, you know, is that fundamental? Do we really have to deal with the fact that when you get to high dimensionality, I mean, humans are what, 200 degrees of freedom? Try to do an optimal control of 200 degrees of freedom. That's that's tough. And you had a robot out there, and it's got a few degrees of freedom, maybe 50. And that gets even tougher. So is that a core problem? And uh, do we need to find a way to get around that? If any of these speakers have been thinking about that, uh, please jump in. Maybe I can start. Yeah, Go that's, ahead, that's a problem. For example, if I if I measure some. Some fatigue, I would measure just for some muscles, and then all, the whole optimization would work on just on those muscles. But then you might uh, involve some other muscles, and you don't measure them, and, and you might make it much worse. And then it could be just uh, not to again. So is there a solution, or is it just? A I don't know. I don't know. That it's still, I mean, using models, yes, you can. We have computational power now that that builds slowly get better and better, and you can probably uh, do the whole whole body and everything. But so, so, so wait a minute, slowly get better and better. How does, those who have been working on optimization, hands up on how many people think we'll be able to do 200 degrees of freedom optimal control in real time in the next 10 years? <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean by real time? 200. I mean, we have muscles, we have muscle fibers. <laughs> so just, you know, oh, so multiply you that by another million. She made it worse. Yeah, of course. Can you explain to that? I well, I mean I appreciate these optimization and inverse optimization approaches, but um, I think it's you have to be careful not to confuse whatever objective function you get as what people are actually doing. Um, that's it's a description of a way to generate some some movements. Um, and so sometimes you know, thinking a little bit more about the, the structure and constraints. So any structure and constraints that you don't explicitly model in your in your model are going to show up in those uh, in those weights in your optimization uh, in, your, in your cost function, your inverse optimization. So I think a little bit more insight there as to what really are the degrees of freedom and what what are the types of things we might want to optimize. Maybe it's not on a Hip joint, knee joint type of thing. I noticed in one of the talks where they get the very cool inverse optimization, they're, they're continuous functions. I doubt that that's really happening. And what I think is you're, you're seeing some like transitions from one type of behavior to another type of behavior, and maybe those reflect, I don't know, more muscle force rate changes or um, things like that. So I think a more more physiology in the in the model will will help, but at the same time it increases. Um, Freedom. So, so there has to be some hierarchy of, of I think, control or structure. I agree, and the key is to pick the right or the most appropriate 
physiology to evolve, right? Because yeah. it's going to be highly task dependent. And the other layer of complication or thing that we should keep in mind is that the system is adaptable. So I got a question earlier about this human-human interaction, right? And whether people learn to adapt to each other, and they do. Uh, that, that doesn't mean they understand how. I mean, yeah. we can't even describe the how, as you yeah. said, but uh, it's so much kind of ancient that, you know, you, you get to tease it out uh, factor by factor. That's another thing to keep in mind. That you may not need tomorrow to optimize 200 million or into that world. <laughs> in the million and to the 200. Uh, the views of freedom, um, but you have to be acting very careful and thinking about so what kind of task, you know, much physiology, one of everything. So. But maybe just to add um, what you had said before about your recent insights into the muscle spindles, which are at first sight regarded as sensors, but they are active sensors. They sense position, velocity, and force, as you recently showed. So not only do we have that strict distinction between the actuators and the sensors, um, but also we have many more um, actuators, as I just implied, because there is evidence that, at least with biofeedback, that humans can activate single muscle fibers, and you don't want to know the numbers of those. Um, so I think the problem of counting in terms of degrees of freedom in the human body um, as a way of um, can optimization ultimately do that is al almost, and I say that provocatively, leading that approach ad absurdum. So wait, let's hear from some of the engineers. Have people actually use optimization as a in their daily life of bread and butter? Do you think that we should give up on optimization approaches? Where's a we should surely we don't give up on optimization. It's a great tool, right? <clears throat> no. The other concern I had is so optimization requires some sort of a model, and we've heard about how complex the uh, uh, the neuro neuromuscular mechanical system is. Is it really feasible to come up with a good enough model of human neuromuscular skeletal behavior? Skeletal behaviors are enough. If you don't believe that, take a look inside your wrist or your ankle. That's a mess, right? And then you have muscles on top of that, and they're compliant. We have some interesting work on trying to measure actual muscle length. It's hard. But that's just the musculoskeletal system. And you know this neuron stuff, right? Are we going to model that? Is that actually feasible? Or is that something we don't have to worry too much about? Can we get away with dumber, simpler models? What's the trade off? Uh, to me, it's, I mean, the biggest problem not about complexity, but the fact that some models you cannot uh, you cannot uh, validate. So you can measure external force, and then you can you can compare it to the to the estimator, but you cannot measure something inside the body. I mean, you can have a dead body, but then uh, how can you guarantee that what you measure on a dead dead body is, is correct on the on the living body? So uh, to me, the biggest problem is that there's no way to measure something some things in the, and many things in the human body. So you cannot even say that this model is 100% correct. So every challenge is actually an opportunity as well. So does that mean that we have an opportunity to develop new sensors that can actually get measurements of things like force, length? Well, the ultrasound, the ultrasound yeah, yeah, yeah. approach is a potential answer, right? So it has been used to get a lot of insights, for example, in the stretch shortening cycle of the muscle tendon complex that originally you know, we just measured force you get out of it, and they can actually tell how much is taken out by the muscle fiber, how much by the tendon. It's just an example, right? There could be an opportunity to get more insight that 10, 15, 20 years ago were like unthinkable. So, but yeah, I do agree that there could be more, more opportunity to understand the, what's behind force and torque by using some total numbers. So then if you could have one measurement of the physiology, what would it be? Oh. Force. <laughs> <laughs> and so force is going to tell me about fatigue. And oh, so think for, for example, low back, I, I love work on low back pain. At my age, trust me, I don't know what you're talking about. But if I had force, so I can get force, but that doesn't tell me about the compression across my spine. Which happens when I pull. No, I mean internal forces. internal forces. So loading forces, internal 
um, joint forces. So intradisciplinary. Yeah, and any, I think a lot of our hypotheses center around kinematics because we can measure it, um, because we have no way of validating or testing any or modeling internal forces, but they're probably very important in regulating how we move and uh, joint loading and pain and now sensing. Um, so some of some like we made feedback models and we're like, oh, it's center of mass position. Mm -hmm. And it's like, well, um, it has to change gains every time we change a posture. And it doesn't really make sense, but that's all I can measure. Um, it, it might get resolved if, if we had like a force center and it would be a simpler control structure rather than changing gains every different condition. So force, and that's it? <laughs> yeah, force for everything. I would say ENG. I would say ENG. You can get single units. Yeah. 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 So actually, yeah. Actually, the question you asked regarding the optimal optimal control. I think uh, one of the reasons would be for inverse optimal control is if, if, if you have enough of sensors, enough of technology developing in the following 10 years to get more insight in terms of like human neuromechanics, then that can help with more computational power that will happen in the 10 years. So we, I think, I think it's as you said we should give up or shouldn't. Up. I think there is a, the, the 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 future is uh, is there in terms of that is like we should look at it maybe from both the sensor and technology points of view at the same time of computation, a combination of two maybe something that can help in the future. Also in terms of the, the, the application that we do, maybe for some application we don't want the very deep window into human, uh, I don't know, like uh, non -nor mechanical details. Maybe even, for example, some exoskeleton application, we may need uh, just some some measurements, some, uh, some idea about how we can Interpret the output of input, input, uh, inverse, like optimal control, something like that. It's just a slight note. But I think we heard from uh, Katya that the inverse optimal control is great, but you've got to have the rich, as a rich enough set of basis functions to span the behavior. But we heard from uh, both Lena and Dagmar that maybe the, maybe the cost functions include things like communication ability. Well, that's going to be tough to edit, or predictability. I mean, we have energy and fatigue and all that, and that's great, but predictability, that goes into my, I mean, how big is the set of optimal cost functions that I go into my inverse optimal control problem? Yeah, it's a great question. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it, it's a great question. That makes the dimensionality bigger, not smaller, doesn't it? Yeah. 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 So the thing is, the more basis functions you want to consider, the more data you need. Like for the new approach, uh, we have been working on, as soon as you add two or like two or three more functions, you have to double the number of observations. So if you want to consider a very wide set to cover like all the things you can imagine about the motion you want to analyze, then you need a lot of data. And that makes computation harder, and then it takes longer. So it's a trade-off. Um, I guess you need to base your expertise or your insights about the motion, and then try to good like good candidates work on that, eventually you replace a little bit more. But that's one of the issues with inverse optimal control is that you need to make assumptions at some point. And we make assumptions in the model, and then we make assumptions in the costs. But the need for data, that sounds like good news. That means we're not going to be out of a job for a decent decade. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, like, like it was mentioned, uh, one of the questions for my talk, so yeah. Uh, if I, I, my answer was that, yeah, you, if you don't have a precise model, you might still make it roughly better, but but you could make it worse. Uh, you might think you are you are making it better because if you cannot validate your model, you are making it worse, uh, and it might uh, actually cause damage. <coughs> yeah. Well, I was thinking that. Because, because this this is about a uh, human robot interaction, and, and you know, we are talking about more and more and more and more and more, and more complex. But, but then it, when it turns, turns down to conforming the robot to the system, or something those models, we probably don't need to be that fine and that precise. Right? I mean, uh, 
we have so many two degrees of freedom to play with. Uh, well, I don't know what, what that would be for having such so many data and so many fine information to get a, a, a precise model, maybe. But I don't so, see so maybe we don't need a precise model, we don't need gigantic optimization. Yeah, and, and, and another thing is that, in fact, I remarked that some of you have used as a ground truth to show that by this assist something. So you were measuring the metabolic cost from the oxygen or something. So then you would need to that probably also to your model. So if this is what you want to optimize at the end, all the metabolic uh, systems and then just this one output or I mean the, the, the you if you think uh, that everything is optimization and then your output is this, it's really important to you to get to the Sounds about it. No, I agree that we should go with simplified models, as long as we know that they are correct. But uh, but usually, I, at least in my opinion, maybe <laughs> maybe if you if you simplify it, you think that uh, that you're making it even worse. Uh, I don't know because you, like I said, some some things we cannot validate by by measurement. What what why do we need inverse optimal control? I mean, the reason is that we don't have access to the information that we want to have access. Yeah. So maybe if you look at it from like a more, I don't know, like uh, sensor or technology point of view, uh, thinking about like more technology that can give us more insight about the uh, neural activity of the human biomechanics, that can be that can kind of reduce the the, the need for like a like a very big uh, cost function. <coughs> In terms of free trade now, the technology is probably, is probably well. We have now active software sound, high density EMG signals. In terms of central, maybe in following 10 years, we may get better technology that can give us more insights about what's happening in the central nervous system. And with that, we may not need to have like a very complex uh, op inverse optimal control problem to, to address. So that can be a different. I think we we also have a point where we're going to make machines, and the machines are not going to have a million degrees of freedom. That's not going to happen by that time. So do we really have to have such a complex description of the human and a complex optimization to wind up with something where you turn one knob? That, that was your point. Right? Yep. The machine is going to be simpler. Is there a conflict in there? It's just that we're just using the tools that we have, and we don't we have we don't really know how to do the point. You had a nice reaction with them, so yeah. Oh no, you talk about the models, you know. Yeah, but yeah. models being simple but right, was, was that the Well, it was just that, I mean, it seems that it's counterintuitive. I mean, the models, you know, it's, you know, come from a control perspective, it helps you to get going yeah. uh, with, you know, with your control design, right? Yeah, so all models are wrong. All models so are basically, wrong. I mean, yeah, you can spend a lifetime trying to build the most perfect model, but at the end of the day, once you playing with a human, you know, in the loop and a machine, there is so much you can do, right? And there's so much uncertainty that you can account for. Right? Um, so, you know, so. I mean, so just on, on my statement about the degrees of freedom that need to be considered for optimization, I think we probably need to distinguish between how the human operates, say, on its own or in all the type of functional behavior, and there it's probably, at least as a start, this humongous degree of freedom problem. But as we are here to consider human-robot interaction, maybe then optimization in a, in a much more, let's say, tool, um, as a tool to just about get that functional interaction between the robot and the human right, that's a different view of how optimization uh, methods can be useful in the one case, and I think in the other case, when you would just focus on the human, it's probably, again, my statement, provocative, the wrong track. Yeah, so that's what I want to see what I was alluding to earlier, and that's to be really taken into the context that it could be limited by the context of the task. So, you know, for certain tasks, you could follow this particular interaction in a way. So I guess some example of the human human, but this could be expanded also to the world of Dagmar and Linetan, right? Uh, it has to be put in the context of what the, the amount of information required that needs to be exchanged in the task between the two agents. 
uh, there is some changes due to this mutual information that gets exchanged over time. Uh, but that particular model probably is not going to work for a different kind of task, or if you change the constraints. And so, as you said, you know, as long as you are aware of the limitation of the model, you should be able to get the job done with the awareness that it's not going to count for a possible human robot interaction. As long as there is that awareness, for a purely utilitarian perspective, probably you don't need to make this model overly complex. So it would seem like, you know, we're not really concerned with the amount of degrees of freedom they have, but you're really looking for the, the minimal amount of degrees of freedom to not just create a tool, but to create tools that we can physically embody and feel human-like. Because it seems like a common theme across most of these is how do we get these things to feel human, to act like they're human, or to move like a human. So it's really, I would say, finding that minimum viable degrees of freedom in your model that would enable that. Yeah, I don't know that like looking for the perfect model is the right approach. I think a lot more human experimentation and kind of Looking across a wider range of conditions, so we saw, you know, people are doing certain instances of movements, and your interaction might work in that very specific instance. But what we really need to look at is sort of generalizability across various conditions, and just being aware um, that people are going to respond differently. We have many degrees of freedom to uh, sort of take advantage of in this in this interaction, and so. Um, Thinking of the human as this machine is probably not the right approach. You're not going to find the cost function or the model, or um, and, and and so better for better, more comprehensive experiments with the human. But uh, I like this question. So, do does the exoskeleton, let's say, I, I think you're talking about exoskeleton in this case, right? Well, I mean, it could be multiple things, exoskeleton okay. or robot or like whatever it may be. For the, for the robot arm, I don't think it should move or work like human because it should work to be optimal for the, for the task. Okay. But if it's on the human, then you could consider this, does it have to be like human? You could say yes to, to not to oppose human, but then if you put the exoskeleton on a human, you have a new system. It's not just human anymore. So maybe you need uh, something uh, something new. That's so in that context, a question that occurs to me is look, this, this uh, session was about using human movement science to understand or better understand human robot uh, physical interaction. But it seemed to me that we had two classes there with those what I would call contact human robot interaction and physical, meaning non contact, but it's still, it's still physical because something the human did affected something the robot did. Does that, are those usefully considered to be part of the same continuum or should they be considered separately? There's a different set of problems and a different set of models associated. Any comment on that? Should we have a single, <coughs> uh, let's see, it would be PCHRI, PC sounds that, PC sounds that, I'm politically correct, I'm not sure. But um, are these the same type of problem or are they different types of problems? Is there a useful parallel between them? If you're looking at non-contact physical human robot interaction, I'm not sure I care too much about the uh, things like the million neurons or whatever it is. I just don't want to get hurt, that's all. So, are these the same thing or are they, are they different? And do we need to just distinguish between the contacts? So with non-contact, you mean like an endpoint robotic system or well, well, non-contact? Some, some of the words that we saw there. Collision avoidance. Just children. Just children. Yeah, for example. So movement. <laughs> <laughs> just exactly. So, um, <laughs> so I think it's a useful exercise or a research goal to regard them as both uh, as the same thing, such that in the one case of contact, you have physical contact and exchange of forces, but then you have forces at a distance. And in human experiments, again, there is very nice uh, demonstrations that say, if I do that, right, I don't need to do that. That was a good demonstration. <laughs> So the, the, the visual expansion, the optic flow, indicates that something approaches you and that exerts, well, the retreat equivalent to a force, maybe somewhat different, 
but I think with with that um, comparison or likening, it might be just an attempt, worth an attempt, to just take all the ideas, tools into from the physical contact to the non-physical, but nevertheless contact, maybe at a different <laughs> 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 I think it's interesting because we, we always say, oh, well, these human robot collaborations, they don't even touch each other. But I, they're more similar than we think, especially since we're walking with the hand. And how does this change your feet? Like, there is no direct context. We're, we're, we're specifically interested in behaviors that don't just actuate a single joint. And even if you are actuating a single joint, you're, you're changing yeah. the entire body. So. Um, like in our grant, we call this like a, a mental Jacobian um, because there's a, there's a mental, perceptive, uh, interpretive process that's happening that causes the entire body to change, not just the, the direct contact point. Including, sorry, no, that including that, you know, just touch contact can be much more than the pure mechanical force that I exert, but I, I, I transfer information about <laughs> so we're talking about yeah. So. Robotic caressing. <laughs> <laughs> but so I think to regard human object and human human contact as a pure mechanical contact is an impoverished way of looking at it. And the one widely accepted result for that is postural balance can be significantly enhanced just with touch, much without any mechanical support. So I think this boundary between physical interaction and non-physical interaction may be too, too categorical. So yeah, I think uh, one of the key words is panic of the two categories, communication. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so at the end of the day, whether we're going to call it uh, communication of intention or my personality traits, that may play a role in how we communicate what I want to get from you, what you want to get from me, and the evolution of the interaction. Uh, this can occur with gaze, can occur with, you know, by touch, can occur with number of it. it doesn't have to be limited to physical. How we digest that information, that's the other question, right? Or how your personality traits interact with that, also another kind of other question. So there's a very interesting model in work by uh, the group by Kawato, where they looked at this um, uh, joint task that you know, we both can decide it. Um, and basically this modeling looks at what makes these two people work better together. And the model that better explained the performance of the joint task was that the one of the individual, each individual is able to create an internal model, for lack of a better word, of the other agent. And integrates his own internal model or what he expects his own to do and what the other person is expected to do in the future so that you adapt your responses and try to predict what the other person is about to do because you accumulated this information after repeated exposure to that interaction. So really it's a very rich um, kind of space in terms of how we actually make a decision about what to do. Um, but yeah, going back to the original point, these two categories are definitely not distinct. I think the communication what we communicate and how we interpret that communication is the key um, element of the spanning of the two things. Do you think that for this communication you really need a very complex model? Just going back to the first one. That's, that's, that's a good question. It depends how... I mean, I'm, I'm just because of what you're saying. It's very good. It's collaborating, yeah. right? So I can model you very fast. Yeah. Maybe based on experience, based on things you could. Based on things you, could. you could. Uh, I guess <coughs> going back to uh, what we started, it may also be a function of the kind of task what I do. So the, the flowchart I borrow from uh, one of the paper by today, you know, it sounds very categorical. Well, if you want to be antagonistic, they don't cooperate. If you want to cooperate, and then they're all, it's a fantastic starting point. But even within each box, you can spend years trying to tease out. So even this little forward thing, right, which is pervasive in the uh, cognitive neuroscience literature, you put physical interaction, all of a sudden, like, how do I even define this, mm -hmm. right? And so I think the answer to this question is highly, that the answer is highly dependent on the nature of the task and many other factors. But you know, the nature of the task, I think, you know, the extent to which you can model how you're going to respond to 
your forces or to your way you move and we don't you know exchange forces etc. It's stuff to tell, right? Mm -hmm. But if we but if we treat uh, contact and contact physical interaction and non-contact physical interaction as part of the same uh, field, which is fine. How do we deal with things like safety and ergonomics? So when I talk to you, I don't think my safety is that much of this. I'm not sure, but, this, but, but, but my point is that the safety considerations may be quite different. And ergonomics, I think, is much more, to me, it sounds like that also tells you that if I'm physically lifting stuff up, I didn't even think about it until I wrote that. But how do we, I mean, so are the same considerations equally applied across all parts of, of this uh, joint? Well, I mean, clearly there's this physical part that I like and think about and mechanics. Um, you know, I think we even have to think about is, is movement the goal? Is movement the, even a measure of like whether things are successful? Um, and and so we have to get beyond just like looking at kinematics. Um, we have to look at the inter interaction. We have to look at stiffnesses. We have to look at impedances, stability. Um, what is the kind of um, dynamics that you can shape your your body to? Um, do naturally without control, right? So, um, so I think we have to think about that type of movement and interaction in a more uh, robust way beyond just descriptive kinematics, although that's a, that's a starting point. Um, and and the, clearly you don't have to think about that with non-contact, but I think the idea that the contact one is all about just kinematics is, is you know, has to, has to change. To think about embodied and, and, and a whole goal and, Contextualize the environment, a goal, a behavior, emotion, you can convey emotional responses, and all, all types of things with with movement beyond just getting from A to B. So, if I if I had to make the distinction, I would make it based on whether I, I looked at it from the robot control perspective. So, I would make the big distinction between whether the robot is wearable or not. So, if the robot is not wearable, it's the same if you're touching or if you're just doing what, like this kind of uh, <coughs> thing. But if it, there's a wearable robot, the control is, uh, is completely different, I would say. But I would, I'd let me jump in and, say, and suggest, uh, you, so if I have physical contact, I mean, what's the, what's the fail-safe mode? I mean, should the robot fail soft or should the robot fail hard? Does it, does it freeze and stop moving? Or does it begin? Mm -hmm. Should not fail. That's our job. Number one, in the real world, is death, is taxes, and machines fail. I think I think it's a very interesting conversation. So I'm I'm hearing three different terminologies. One is communication. There's a paper recently published in Nature Communication on haptics. So there's a communication when I'm wearing a wearable wearable technology like an exoskeleton. I'm I'm communicating with my exoskeleton. Uh, that is communication, and then we at the same time we have the contact and the stability and uh, the, the points that so, so we should be careful in terms of. So it's not about communication; it's about the robot behaving in a safe way or not. So it's more on the contact, and at the same time we have interaction. When the, my, my, my mechanics we now part of the mechanics of the robot, and there's an interaction between two mechanical systems. One of them bio, one of them not bio, and then so maybe we can categorize it into three categories, contact, communication, and interaction, just as a search. What's the difference between interaction and contact? So I would consider uh, points like safety and failure and uh, yeah, damage like as contact more, and stability, and uh, or yeah, but then we have internet bullying, and that's not contact, <laughs> it's damage. And you're right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I'm not being attacked. Thanks for that. Thank you. She never finds the conversation boring. <laughs> 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 I was being conceited, but um, my sense is that I, I think that ergonomics, I think, belongs more in the context of physical contact type interaction. But is there a corresponding version of ergonomics and safety for the non-contact kind of interaction? I don't know the answer, but 
clear? Well, from, from an engineering perspective, a mechanical engineering perspective, you have the concept of energy, of course, that, that sort of uh, And then if you look at the norms, the, the, the safety norms for robots that are around you, etc., they are, they are put into the, the, the kinetic, uh, kinetic energy that you can store and, and, and uh, fuel in terms of the maximum force that you can apply. In the, so safety without contact is, you know, if you have a heavy robot that goes exactly what we did, right? Not, not that you have a, a, a heavy robot, but if you have, if your velocity is high and the mass is high and you are close, this is, you have the, the, the same issues and you will feel the danger as well. If it's a very lightweight robot, it will go slowly and it's soft and uh, so they get the, has low energy, so, so probably the energy is uh, something that can um, consider the proposed case. Yeah, but By the way, this is what you have used uh, yeah. as a criteria in your first uh, talk. Yeah, no, uh, actually, but in this case, uh, it, it would fit with this uh, wearable and non wearable because if you are wearing a robot, you are, you are kind of the same in inertia. System, but uh, but if if it's something externally coming at you, then uh, it can harm you actually uh, with with the with the kinetic energy. But but if you have uh, it attached to you, then it's like part of the, of the same system. Um, I have an example of non-physical, uh, non-contact human robot physical interaction. So. Uh, recently, we have more motion capture system, which can map human motion to control a more complex uh, robot system. So one ongoing research in my lab is we find out that while human teleoperating robots with their own body, there are still issues about what is the physical fatigue and what part of the task of teleoperation usually cause more fatigue than the other, and what muscle tends to be more fatigued in this process. So the human actually not in physical contact with remote robot, but there's still human muscle effort and fatigue consideration. So I'm thinking there's there's consideration about what is the ergonomics of robot automation uh, instead of just ergonomics of the physical design of the robot. For example, what part of the task you want robot to automate such that the fatigue can be minimized or reduced based on the personal preference or behavior. So I think maybe there's another scope, like the ergonomics of robot automation that we can put some effort to study. Just share my thoughts. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, yeah, but, uh, but if you're carrying something and, and if you're carrying it like this and the robot go, goes toward itself, it kind of takes some of the load. Right. So, uh, yeah, yeah, but uh, yeah. Your, your system, like your your idea is different, so it's like remote. Uh. Yeah, I can give you more detail about the example. Like uh, one task we perform is let like, people to uh, uh, pick and place object or stacking object together, and we find out some of the teleoperation tasks like precise manipulation or precise remote camera <coughs> control cause more fatigue, and this is exactly the physical fatigue we, we can actually minimize by some kind of robot automation. And so this, I, I just feel that um, uh, all what we have studied about uh, physical human robot inter interaction and automation uh, design can be extended to this uh, kind of distant or distributed human robot physical interaction. Yeah, I guess it takes more complexity because you need to know uh, what, what kind of uh, phases the task have and what you have, what right, you can right. do, yeah. Right. It's more, and it might also work on the cognitive fatigue, which uh, we did not talk about a lot today. Right, cognitive fatigue is the issue. Um, I actually have um, a question for you particularly is, um, I see a lot of fatigue study is about re repetitive motion. Yeah. And uh, when the motion becomes more freeform, uh, the fatigue estimation based on EMG is, is very complicated. So w would you mind to share your insight that how to extend uh, the fatigue study uh, from 
uh, more repetitive or regular motion to more freeform motion with the bent wages. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, the one of the, the earlier idea to, to estimate muscle fatigue was to estimate, of, uh, to check, they make a frequency analysis, spectral uh, analysis of the, of the right. EMG. Right. But that only works, at least in my experience, if you produce some constant right. force. If you're doing something uh, mm -hmm. like uh, some sign or something, it will not work. So that's why we wanted to have either uh, the latest one that we use is muscle uh, force model, and from the muscle force, then you can you can in integrate it slowly and uh, dis dissipate it slowly based on the on what's happening. So basically, you 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 measure the current effort and then you integrate it. So then even if it changes, it means that if now it's really high, it will integrate more. If it's if then in the next instance get lower, it will integrate less. So I think that's my only solution I can give. Yeah. Thank you for sharing. So another thought that occurs to me is um, we heard from several of the speakers earlier today and this afternoon that uh, not all humans are alike. We have different <laughs> and so we need to. So does that mean that our definitions of safety, of ergonomics, of optimality are completely individual dependent? So, for example, is it safe to give me a machine that lets me uh, get lazy? I mean, perhaps not. So how how important? What I'm getting at? How important are individual differences not only in neuromusculoskeletal biomechanics, but also in things that we might include in our personal optimization functions. Like, I like to wave my hands around, okay, I don't know where that came from, but I've done it for years. Some people just like to sit. Is that, an, is that how important is that in including, do we have to include that in the design of the machines to interact with people and with mechanical engineers? That's hard, but we can do it. I would say those are important considerations based on what I read in the literature, there are factors that, you know, you normally would not even think of in the design of robot active humans. But this is where understanding human human might give you some, some insights and you should give attention to. I'll give the example of configuration. Face to face versus side by side, one of the only groups showing this. Um, it's something you never think of as being important, but finally for humans, what for human is important. Well, actually, in, in World War II, they designed the Mosquito. It was, a, it was a night fighter. They designed it with side by side, pilot and co pilot, rather than the American design, which is uh, you know, front and back, pilot and pilot, co pilot. And that was precisely for uh, better morale of pilots. So, you know, this is the kind of thing that we're probably, I wouldn't say hardwired, but there's something that makes us act, react, or in the sense of agency, there's so many aspects that will trickle down to how we interact with other humans. So the open question for designers, controllers, etc., is how much of this innate or natural uh, attitude that we have or sensitivity to say configuration should be factored in the design of a core of it. Mm -hmm. it, it might be completely nonsensical as a question if you say, oh, but you know, a robot is a machine, so why would you expect a human to react in the same way, or there might be something there that you probably should pay attention to when you think about designing a, a cooperating with a machine. Yeah. And well, we, as example, never get that, right? I work at Automob, and uh, we did a lot of prosthetics, uh, lower limbs especially, and this is a big problem sometimes. So you do the alignment of the prosthetic, you have a system, and you consider that this is best for the patient, the patient will not like it. Because he's been, ah, no, this is very strange. I've been using these other prosthetics for five years, and I like it how it fits. But now I have a new one that is very modern, it's technological, it's fit to my body, but I don't like how it fits. So I can use it. I go back to my body. And this is a big problem. Because at the end, okay, we think that this is the best way that he should use it, but he doesn't do it, and then he has to always fall back to that. And then you have to compensate. Uh, so it's, it's, it is a complicated challenge. Does that mean we should be thinking about human robot interaction as a way to study humans? <laughs> 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 
lot of data. The data source. We got lots and lots of data, and that's what you need, right? Lots and lots of data. <laughs> So we, we also experienced the same um, situation for when we presented an uh, hypothesis to an uh, NPP. But the NPP changed um, his stuff after like intense um, training. So we need to, we needed to somehow take out our heat, hit our comfort zone, and then move it to another zone. So therefore they can use better use the hypothesis. Yeah. So it seems like there's um, like a there's an inter in interaction part. Right? We need to uh, consider how to like, make a robot to interact better with a robot, with uh, a uh, human being. But so we need to think about how we can kind of change human's mind set to better interact with a like, robot. So. It also happens a lot with these uh, exoskeletons for industrial yeah, applications. Yeah, yeah. So now we're, uh, we're producing one of those uh, overhead task exoskeleton capacities to the person. They give it to the worker and the worker gives it a like, no, I don't like it. I don't need it. I can do my job without any of it. And this is a very common response. And also, you know, it's, it's nothing about, maybe not even how you feel, it's how you already have a preconception of what you have, and that already changes how you interact with the problem. And that is a, an interesting problem. But of course, I think it's important. Did they put fancy flashy stripes on it? Well, it, uh, pilots don't like to wear helmets because they're heavy. Right? Yeah. But if you put little blazes on them and stuff like that, that <laughs> well, it's really they, they, they will not like it because the problem, one of the problems is that now when I'm using the rope, my colleagues will, will think that yeah. I'm not strong. <laughs> yeah. So. <laughs> so in the two examples that you gave, both with the prosthetic and the exoskeleton, you had people who were already using either a particular device and then they had to switch to something else, or they Not were? Not necessarily. So okay. The exoskeletons, people that never use rope. Yeah, but. Uh, they're exactly yeah, at the I, beginning. I see what you're saying, but for instance, in that case, they've been, say, trained at the task and maybe they're sure. experienced users. So potentially, you could um, hypothesize that if you gave someone who had no experience at the task the support so that they could learn the task from the beginning, doing it with assistance then they would actually prefer it that way because they wouldn't have a preconception of what it felt like uh, to do it in a certain way that they've already gotten used to? Yes. I'm not saying this is true in all cases. No, no, no. I mean, it is not true in all cases. So for prosthetic, especially when you meet the person for the first time, you need to have a rehabilitation process. And then if you don't, if a lot of people at the end of this process, they reject the procedure. So it's the same, you know, because maybe they feel that it's not right for them. Not the thing that, and then they always try to find something different. So it depends on the person. So it goes back to that. Everyone is very different. So. <laughs> I guess I wanted to use it as, a, as to propose a different idea that maybe we think of adapting all of the machines to how we move naturally and optimizing it so that the machine resembles the most how a person moves. But maybe since most of these are assistive devices that are assisting with a specific task. So really the metric that we care about the most is the task performance and not particularly the execution. We just want the execution to be comfortable for the person and for the person to adapt the device. Uh, but in the end, we care about how they perform at the task. So maybe it's okay to say, well, this isn't how it feels naturally, but maybe not even us, maybe the next generation of us will feel that if they get used to interacting with devices in certain ways, they did, then it's also us that adapt with these devices if we see enough of an increase in performance in the specific tasks that they're assisting us with that they don't need to actually be moving the same way we move or they don't have to feel intuitive, maybe not intuitive, but supernatural from the very beginning because we can also have an adaptation process to them as long as we feel like it's worth it in the end payoff that we care about. There's two problems with that. One is how you measure that they're doing the task correctly. And I guess we we'll go back to the models <laughs> uh, because it's very difficult to know what is the impact on the body. And the other problem is that if you have a prosthesis that is not very well set up, then you will have potentially a lot of problems in your musculoskeletal system across the, your body in the future. Because you're doing, you're walking in a way that is not meant for your body to walk. And then you will have problems in the future. So 
it is a difficult thing. So is your brain, I think, the prosthetic is a specific example because it's like an extension of your body and you're using it for a task of walking that you really already knew how to do. And now, you, so now you're just trying to do a fit a limb that's going to replace your previous limb in this very specific task that you want to complete in the same way that you've been doing it for the years until you lost your limb, right? Uh, but if we think about other more collaborative tasks, especially with the arms and um, things like that, I think maybe in that context in particular, it's interesting to think about it. Is it necessary to, like you guys were talking about, modeling the human so intricately? Maybe that doesn't matter. Maybe we just have to focus on making the task uh, as optimized as possible so that the outcome is good, and then maybe we can expect some adaptation uh, from the human. So a good example of what you're talking about is automobiles, right? An automobile is a thing that gets me from here to there real fast without having to spend a whole lot of work. These days, an automobile is a robot, basically. There's a spectacular amount of control and communication going on on the web. When you press on the gas pedal, that doesn't change the, the, the What that does is that suggests to the controller what you might want to have happen. But that's a good example of something where we, you know, we have adapted to what we're used to them by now. But if you go look at some of the old classic automobiles, they're astonishing to operate. So, but there, I think the the key the key performance measure was things like reliability, getting from point A to point B as fast as possible without getting killed. We're not going to do so well on that, but um, I think that's your that's your point. We don't actually have to have a, a, a system that is purely based on my present conception of. That machine in the Just a, maybe an off remark, but I can't help just thinking of shoes, right? They extend our capabilities of walking on uneven terrain, but they have become a lot more than that, right? And I love shoes. So. You understand. So, <laughs> so we trade off certain things by the beauty of the extension of the body. Glasses, right, have long stopped. I, I, I admire your glasses. Thank you. <laughs> they have long stopped to just be a crutch for bad eyes, right? They are the jewels in the face. And so at cars, whatever the robots are in the cars, they are, especially for men, Right? They're show of it. So what I'm thinking is that, I mean, these exoskeletons at the moment are clunky. But if we make them more beautiful so that they become, and I say that again, extremely a fashion item that you really want it, and you even trade off a little bit of comfort because you look so damn cool. <laughs> <laughs> or there's another approach. So you know these uh, cigarette boxes have this ugly picture. So at the workplace, you could, you could <laughs> hang out the pictures of crooked people like that. Maybe they would like think, okay, because I mean, even when you're smoking, it's it's nice for the moment, but you don't think about the future. But uh, it's the same in the exoskeleton. It's maybe not nice at the moment wearing it, but it might help you on the long run. I, I can give another example. Like two rooms from there, people are talking about surgical robots. So that's the same problem, the same same conversation is happening there. Uh, so like if, if 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 you ask surgeons who used to like doing open heart surgery for 50 years, saying that okay, we give you this robotic system uh, that can reduce the blood loss, enhance the this and this and that, which is not like but there's not maybe enough of studies on, on that. They may not like it. There's a lot of surgeons that they don't like it. So there are companies trying to advertise, trying to kind of evaluate the performance of the system to show that it is really helping or not. Because the surgeons are used to using that technique without the technology, performing open heart surgery for years and decades, and the patients can survive. And now the success rate for that surgery is very high. But in the same field of research, there are surgeries that are not, uh, that they don't exist without the robots, like micro, micro surgeries because our physiological framework is much higher than the accuracy of those surgeries. So without the use of robots, we cannot do cell manipulation. We cannot do many of the other th things. So I think it's kind of related to the other com uh, uh, comment that, it was, uh, that, that, that we're talking about. So if the technology is replacing some of the functions that we have already, 
they have a like, hard time as engineers to, to sell it. So to, to mark to find the right to find the right application to, to we should make it very careful so that people the end user can accept it. But if we are proposing a new uh, ability, uh, augmenting human sensory motor skill in a way that without the technology it is not possible, then that can be some may, may be easier. Then we may have less I don't know uh, communication in terms of why or why not. Just as a like, side note to what. So you're saying that if we, if we can make robots that help us do things we can do, then we don't have to worry about fashion. The fashion is very interesting. I, I lived in Japan for seven years, or around here, and they have a very different perception of robots than Western <laughs> society has, right? And uh, for me, it was very shocking, this, this let's see, but, but this is something that has been changing in Europe. You know, you have these movies, and you have this Iron Man and the suit, and so, People, the new generations are more accepting in this, in this system. So maybe this is something that will be used more like ah, wearing an exoskeleton. How yeah, cool yeah, I am! Yeah, totally. I, I, totally. I, mean, yeah, again, I, yeah. I do something else as well as fashion. So uh, I mean, I'm yeah. not only interested <laughs> in fashion, but, <laughs> but if you look at sort of the avant-garde fashion, they include all lots of technology and materials in electronic design. So there is this totally different direction of incorporating technology only to the cool. There's no yeah. no desire there. Yeah, there, this is interesting. For example, if you have a, an activated prosthesis, one problem that we have is the sound of the noise. So you're walking mm -hmm. all the time. This is no good for, for a user. But when you see who is the user, it's always very old people. And young people are more accepted of uh, accepting this more because having this <laughs> makes them go, no hope, right? <laughs> <laughs> so I walk in my, my classroom, and you know, it's like, look at me, wow! <laughs> uh, so this is something I think it would even change for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And for the cigarette thing, I, I don't think this works very much for the smoking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I know, I see how it's going to buy It doesn't work, but it doesn't work. I don't know what it does. But one thing is safety, and, and that is a very important thing for exoskeletons. Safety. Exoskeletons are very clunky. The mm -hmm. reasons why they are clunky is because of the mechanisms and the control. And for that, we need models to improve that. But we need to make these systems to be safe. The robot that you have also, in the videos, it's just very nice. But if you are doing a normal task, you do the task very fast. If the robot is slightly slow or something, the person will not like it immediately. Right? Kind of making my task more difficult than it should be. So uh, we still need to fix a lot of things. There's still a lot of things that we have to work on, which is good for research, I would say. <laughs> and it goes back to the models that we have to work on.
it's in my head. And the same, again, fashion note. I look. I, I just came across a, an antique store looking at a bucket full of canes, and all in ivory, you know, or silver, and real, real jewelry things where people they wear them to show them off, right? As well as as support. So just one more example where the crutch has been elevated to something that you want to use because it's a, a lion head in ivory. Something like that. <laughs> That's 100 years ago, but they just, they just did it, so. I think the problem is with exoskeletons. I would, I would use it if it was working. <laughs> 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 